Welcome back to another episode of the Real News Network podcast. My name is Mel Buer, and I'm a staff reporter here at the Real News Network. I am so glad that you're back with us. The Real News is an independent, viewer-supported, nonprofit media network. We don't take corporate cash, we don't have ads, and we don't put our reporting behind paywalls. To stay up to date on the important stories that we're covering, sign up to our free newsletter at therealnews.com forward slash sign up. Follow us on social media and consider becoming a monthly sustainer at therealnews.com forward slash donate. Over the last couple of years, labor organizing has experienced a resurgence across the United States. High-profile organizing drives, contract fights, and strikes have been given considerable airtime by local and national outlets, which in turn has exposed new audiences to the ways in which unions organize and fight for their working members. Just as these audiences are learning about the American labor movement, they are also learning about the ruthlessness of the employers who fight tooth and nail to prevent unions from gaining a foothold in the workplace. One of these union-busting tactics is to bring in outside union avoidance consultants, or persuaders, to try and sow doubt and discord among the unionizing employees. As labor reporters, when looking into union drives in elections, we often hear stories of the union avoidance firms who come onto the shop floor and attempt to dissuade workers from organizing. This million-dollar industry deploys armies of subcontractors to achieve these ends. And despite their reputation for derailing union drives across the country, the exact nature of the industry and the money that flows through it is harder to pin down. With us today to talk about this elusive industry is Dave Jameson, who has been HuffPost labor reporter since 2011. His recent five-part investigative series, The Persuaders, was just released at HuffPost and attempts to pull back the curtain on the union-busting industry. Before joining the D.C. Bureau, Dave was a staff writer at Washington City Paper and a freelancer contributing to Slate, The New Republic, The Washington Post, and Outside Magazine, among other outlets. He's won the Livingston Award for Young Journalist, the Hillman Foundation Sydney Award, and the Deadline Club Award for Best Business Feature. He's also the author of a nonfiction book, Mint Condition, How Baseball Cards Became an American Obsession. Welcome, Dave. Thanks for joining us today. Good to be here, Mel. Let's get right into it. In your five-part series, in one of the articles titled Inside Corporate America's Favorite Union-Busting Firm, you spend some time examining Labor Relations Institute, a notorious union buster who boasts thousands of successful anti-union campaigns. I myself learned about LRI when writing a story about a contentious and ultimately unsuccessful union drive at private equity-backed Sabre Industries in Sioux City, Iowa back in 2022. It's kind of a gnarly beast to try and uh, reach in and and see what's going on there. More broadly, can you shed some light on the firms, these union-busting firms? How do they usually operate? What's what's the the sort of process by which they get engaged in these anti-union campaigns? So it's it's a really interesting world. the The whole system generally runs on on like subcontracting. You have the persuaders themselves who go into the workplace to talk to the workers and basically run a campaign against the union, which involves figuring out how p- individuals plan to vote, figure out who's on the fence and who's persuadable. Uh, but to get those people. Companies usually, employers usually go through firms like the Labor Relations Institute. LRI is kind of probably the best known, I think. They, a lot of the, you know, big name companies like, um, you know, Dollar General, Cisco, Aramark, they, they over the years have all gone through through L- LRI. Um, LRI, interestingly, and I, I went down to Tulsa, they're based in Broken Arrow, which is a, a, a suburb of Tulsa in Oklahoma. And it's just this little, um, this this kind of dinky little office between a dog grooming shop and a and a bar, um, and it is it is just built on subcontracting. So you, as an employer, reach out to LRI. LRI links you up with a persuader or a group of persuaders who are based like all over the place. A lot of these folks are are out of California, and LRI essentially just takes a cut. And what I was able to see generally in court documents is my best guess is LRI keeps about half of the fees, right? So the kind of going rate in the industry these days is like 3200 or 3500 a day for a persuader. So a firm like LRI, you might be paying the 3500 for Joe the persuader. About half of that is probably going to, to LRI, and you're, you're essentially paying a sort of a broker's fee or an administrative fee. 
And so firms like LRI, it's very hard to get a handle on the money, in part because the disclosure requirements are really weak. Uh, but LRI, you know, has been dishing out, um, you know, in the millions each year to their subcontractors. So they probably have quite a bit of money coming in, especially as there have been a lot of union election petitions and, and, and a lot of organizing going on. You know, it's not clear to me whether employers really know that they're kind of paying a, a significant finder's fee when they when they when they go through a firm like LRI. But that's basically what they're doing. In your series, you kind of spend a a pretty significant amount of time laying out exactly what these union avoidance campaigns look like. You've kind of touched on this briefly already. In your first article in the series, Workers Wanted a Union, Then the Mysterious Men Showed Up, these persuaders often view their work in militaristic terms, which I also, you know, came across in my, you know, brief examination of LRI. They have a a white paper that you can find on their website, uh, essentially comparing union organizing drives to, uh, placing IEDs in the road in Iraq, uh, which is a wild comparison to make. But, you know, these campaigns that the wage against workers are obviously very calculated um, with the express goal of keeping a union out of the workplace. Can you just expand a little bit on this, what this looks like? And additionally, you know, these consultants often have a background in the labor movement. Um, A lot of times they come from uh, organizing positions such as like with the Teamsters or, you know, in my brief touch on it with IBEW. And then they somehow, you know, through whatever reasons, end up on the other side of the the line there and, and start working as consultants. Can you kind of just give us a sense of how that plays into this calculation for how these campaigns work in the workplace? Sure. So it, as the union organizer said to me, you know, the, the, the consultants essentially run an organizing campaign like the union organizers only only in reverse, right? And so when you and I was able to see this in documents we got through records requests where um, you know essentially files where the consultants are writing creating daily notes, they're building spreadsheets, um, they're rating individuals on their levels of union support, usually on a scale on a scale of one to five, say where a one would be pro-company in their words, meaning anti-union, and five would be very pro-union. And so you're, you're sort of mapping out the, the, the entire workplace, getting a feel for, okay, the election was held today, you know, how would it go? And crucially, who are our, our fencers, the, the, the folks on the fence? And what is our sort of best line of persuasion for them? And so you see in a lot of these cases, their their persuaders are are writing files like, you know, uh, Mel here, uh, you know, grew up uh, a mile from the facility. You know, we, we, we think uh, they're concerned about about job stability. Um, they, they have a 10 year old kid at home. So they're, they they want to make sure their job's going to be there. These are literally that's something that that was in, in some of these files, a case like that, where they're really diving into workers personal lives to figure out what will be sort of the best argument against a union. And so they're, they're sort of trading notes on individual workers and um, they're running a campaign, you know, hard on the ground up, right up until the, until the ballots are cast. Right. So I think a lot of people assume this job is mostly about corralling workers in the break room and, you know, give them a speech about how, you know, unions, fail to deliver and you might never get a contract, um, you know, you, you you might end up going on strike, blah, blah, blah. And that is a big part of it. But what they're do, also doing is this sort of um, behind the scenes work where, I mean, literally, you if you are in one of these meetings, you are being observed. They, they want to, to they're looking for cues on, on where your leanings are on a union. And so that is really sort of the kind of the more behind the scenes work that is going on. And of course, you know, unions are doing something similar on their own end of, of you want to know, um, you know, whether Joe is for the worker or against, and if, 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 or if Joe is persuadable, you know, what, what's the best argument we can make, you know, to make, to make Joe a union voter. Big difference is the, the union doesn't have guaranteed access to the workers the way the employer does. The employer in mandatory fashion can require everybody come in and hear what, what our, our persuader has to say about why unions suck. Well, and certainly the employer is furnishing all of this information to these uh, consultants in a way that maybe the unions don't also have access, right? 
And certainly, you know, as part of my reporting, I've heard what happens inside these captive audience meetings. And it's definitely one of those things where individuals are surveilled and are separated out based on how militant maybe they respond to these meetings. Um, And certainly uh, it can, you know, they seek to drive wedges in between this sort of burgeoning organizing solidarity on the shop floor. Uh, And they use really sometimes vague language, right? They're very good at sort of manipulating conversation and and towing this this line of what the language is. You know, uh, they are often saying, we're not discouraging you from joining this union, even though there are giant posters on the wall that say vote no, you know, but they use the language of we're just trying to tell you the truth about what this looks like. And I think a lot of times coming from the labor movement, they they can use that as a bit of authority to say, look, I did this and it did work or, or what have you. Um, and I think that's a huge piece of it. This really is kind of like a counterinsurgency in the workplace. Yeah, it's most of these folks sort of hold themselves out as kind of neutral parties, even though they're obviously hired by the employer. They're paid thousands of dollars and they they have a purpose in being there. They will say we're we're hey we're just here to to give the facts you know I, I've I've been in this world and you may not know you know what a union is really like and how collective bargaining works so I'm going to explain it to you and an interesting thing I saw in a lot of case files at the National Labor Relations Board and I went back through years and years basically finding any case I could where these consultants ended up you know speaking uh, testifying in a hearing often under subpoena. and in a lot of cases uh, you know the judge later wrote you know I didn't I didn't believe what this guy instead because uh, he insisted that he was a neutral party, you know, even under testimony, claimed he was there just to educate. And so I actually talked to quite a few persuaders, the ones that would speak to me. And, you know, it is kind of a mixed bag, you know, from, from a personal standpoint, I was a lot more likely to believe you and what you had to say to me if you were upfront about the purpose of your work. And some of them are. I think others, for whatever reason, insist on hiding the ball, you know, contrary to all logic. Um, you know, interestingly, I did one one persuader I, I interviewed and ended up writing about a guy named Joe Brock, who used to be a teamster himself. He was a, a president at Local 830 in, in Philadelphia. Um, I found him to be pretty forthcoming about about his work and, and, and his experience, which, you know, was frankly um, a little refreshing. And he, he talked a bit about sort of the competitive nature of the job. Right. They are in the they are running a campaign on the other side of the union. And if they're being honest, they want to win, you know? And so even though a lot of these folks w- would say, even in, in board testimony that, you know, I I don't have a dog in this fight, essentially, or, you know, it's it's the employee's choice. I could see in their notes that, that were given over as part of subpoena that you are strategizing on how to defeat the union. You are trying to turn yes votes into no votes and maybe notes in, in, in into uh, into no votes, and it's it's all very clear. This all, you know, has a ver- has a very clear purpose to it. Wasn't Joe Brock briefly the main character on Twitter last week for responding to to some folks about uh, you know being a proud union buster and yeah, know, just, brought up uh, his Brock, you know, defended his line of work. I, I and he, I think he felt that. Um, you know, in my series, I tended to write about, uh, you know, some of the more, you know, colorful characters, uh, you know, like my, my first story was about, uh, speaking of colorful, to to persuaders who went into a workplace under fake names, um, mm. uh, Jack Black and Alex Green. And, and a, another common thread I saw in all my research was, uh, frankly, a lot of persuaders not being forthcoming about who they are. I'm not saying about lying about their identities. But it's clear in a lot of case notes and in, in workers' testimony under oath that they didn't always know who they were talking to or they couldn't get a last name out of the consultant. And there are reasons why consultants would, would might want to hide their last names. They have, they have backgrounds that they may not want workers poking around. And uh, some of, many of them, you know, as you mentioned earlier, come out of unions. You know, one one guy in, in, I saw on board testimonies, he was writing in his notes, you know, so-and-so. I uh, was asking my last name today, <laughs> suggesting that he wasn't telling workers his last name. And this was a union official who had been, um, uh, you know, wh- whose union wh- while he was there had been put in uh, trusteeship and he was sued, you know, under this alleged scheme of, of no show jobs and whatnot. And that was his break from the labor movement. 
and he turned up consulting. So there are certain things that I think they don't want workers uh, to know about. Now, in this extreme case, uh, these guys literally used aliases and workers did not know who they were dealing with. Uh, workers testified months later at a hearing you t saying, referring to, to this guy under his fake name because that, that is what they knew. And it turned out uh, this gentleman you know, re had a recent felony conviction for stalking in Florida. What I think is relevant information that workers might want to know. And frankly, right. I think someone in, with that history might have a hard time getting work if people are, you know, know about that sort of history. And so, so yeah, it is, it is a, a, a very interesting world of, of in, in that case, sort of, um, you know, overt, um, you know, deception, if you want to say, uh, and also sort of a more general among other persuaders. Well, they don't need to know my whole story here. Right. In your third article in the series, you focused on the tactics that union busters use specifically against immigrant workers, you know, especially in the last couple of decades, uh, the organizing in the workplace is really focused a lot on on including and bringing in immigrant workers as a key point in the labor movement um, and a key point in many industries in this country, which is a, a net positive, in my opinion. What are some of the strategies that you found that are kind of specifically targeted to dissuading immigrant workers from joining a union in the workplace? And how are consultants marketing themselves to these employers um, who use these tactics? So, yeah, it, it's a really um, sort of interesting sub-industry of, of the industry, which is why I wanted to write about it, this world of, you know, bilingual consultants who get called in basically when there's a lot of Latino workers. And these are, in, in my research, turned out to be a lot of, in some cases, the most sort of lucrative campaigns on the consultant side, because you're talking about you know, large facilities, you know, say in food production, where there's a lot of workers and a lot of them are are, are Latin American immigrants. And, and one case I wrote about was actually a, a small workplace in Philadelphia at a, a company called United Scrap Metal um, as a, a, a recycling facility where they brought in a, a, a bilingual consultant. And I had sort of their internal notes between the consultants and the, and the company about sort of how do we handle this. And it was just very interesting to see the consultants saying, well, you know, we've done the breakdown and the su support is primarily among the, the, the Honduran workers, you know, as opposed to the the, the workers from Guatemala and, and El Salvador. And so they're trying to sort of get a read on, on the demographics at play during a union campaign. And one of the, the most interesting things I, I, I saw in all my research was in this case, I sort of developed this this strategy of where we're going to okay we're going to we're going to sort of equate the union with dictators their their words you know from these workers home countries and so the whole idea was to sort of you know appeal to to workers backgrounds in a way that could make them question whether they could trust the union and the union in this case was the laborers international or or liuna and so they actually created flyers equating the the Layuna with uh, Juan Orlando Hernandez, the the um, you know former president of Honduras, who's you know been indicted on on drugs and arms uh, arms charges in the U.S. And so th these are the kinds of things you you might see or hear about in an Im in a campaign involving immigrants that basically nobody hears about, right? Um, because this was a this was a campaign that had nobody you know out on Twitter, you know. Uh, flogging support for the workers and that sort of thing. It was just one of these, you know, many campaigns that kind of happens in the dark. And in, and in this case, it was only it was around 30 workers. And it, it was just kind of a sign of the of, of how far employers will sometimes go to prevent, in this case, really, you know, a couple dozen workers from from collective bargaining and, and workers the, the union actually ended up winning that that election two and a half years ago but they still don't have a contract this the litigation is still going on the the, the company is not bargaining and now it's it's in federal court which is like can be you know a real mess for unions so employers can they they can and they do take it very far to the bitter end we see this more broadly and perhaps in more high profile ways in terms of how much money employers are willing to spend to keep workers out on strike, right? Um, but again, it's never about the money, right? It's never about the profit sharing. It's never about any of that. It's about not ceding power to collective worker action in the workplace. And it really is kind of ruthless in the in the ways that employers will engage, in this case, union avoidance 
Uh, it's such a nice way to say union buster, right? Um, essentially, just these these consultants to drive wedges between uh, workers who have quite a bit to gain from collective organization in a workplace. The the thing that really gets me too, and this kind of gets to our last question here, is that you know it's well known that employers use these union busting firms and campaigns all over the country, right? We hear about it. Um, they're oftentimes kind of offhandedly mentioned in in high profile union drives that either fail or don't fail. You know, I think of things like Collectivo Coffee and to a certain extent, sometimes Starbucks, right? Some of the the various things. And independent research projects like Labor Lab have done a tremendous amount of work tracking the anti-union consultants as they land in these workplaces all over the country. Labor Lab has an interactive map that you can kind of pull up various workplaces that are holding uh, union campaigns and and see what consultants have been contracted for which. And I believe they use uh, the data from OMLS. So they're pulling like forms called LM20s and LM10s to to see this paperwork that should be filed on behalf of these consultants and the, and the employers who pay the money out to them. But still, so much of this industry is kind of shrouded in secrecy, right? Why is it so difficult to kind of break through that opacity and be able to to shed light on what is a multi-million dollar industry that really has its its fingers in in every workplace really dispute or organization across the country why can't we find more information so the disclosures are are, are a real mixed bag you know on the the nice end the disclosure requirements are there right there is a law from 1959 it's the same law that says you know every union's got to file this you know huge book of a co- of an annual report and disclose everyone's salaries blah 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 which I, I like that as well as a reporter. Um, you know, I think the union transparency is important. It also requires transparency on the employer side. Unfortunately, the that stuff is not very well enforced, right? There, there's requirements that if you're a consultant and you know Amazon or whoever hires me, I'm supposed to to send in a, a transparent report within 30 days so that workers know who I am and what I'm being paid. Um, it's it's poorly enforced. It's poorly followed. These things are filed like late all the time, and and unfortunately, they're often filed you know after the campaign has ended when the disclosures are really of no value to to the workers. And and why are the disclosures important? Look, this is a, a workplace election, just like a U.S. political election. I, I think people deserve to know how money is influencing them, right? And there's often a lot of money pouring into these campaigns. Workers deserve to know who's lobbying them and what they're being paid. So often the consultants, they don't, you know, they say they just had an oral agreement with the employer. Frankly, it's kind of hard to believe in a lot of cases that any company is going to basically write a blank check on this consulting work and not have something in writing. And just in a lot of cases, workers don't know who they're dealing with. I talked to people who, you know, said, who, who've written to me, you know, over the years, like, you know, so-and-so has been consulting in my place and uh, there, there's no record of it. You know, I think she'd consulted this other place. And it's just people have a very poor handle on on what's going on. And so I think that's part of the frustration with, you know, advocates on the worker side is to get some teeth to to the enforcement. And I think, you know, frankly, they are doing a, a, a better job under under Biden. It was kind of a joke during the Trump years. At least that's what the data suggests. We saw disclosures plummet. Some of that may have been, you know, the consultants getting less work. I, it's hard to imagine that that really accounts for the drop off. I think a lot of the, the consultants and employers thought, well, nobody's nobody's watching things right now, so so no need to file. So they are they are bugging people. I, even a consultant told me he's like, I feel like I'm I'm being harassed <laughs> these days by this office. But you know, there almost never is. I've, I found no documented case of someone being prosecuted for like willfully ignoring the requirements. And another downside is is on on the employer side. Even if you're you're following the law, you can file these so late that people don't find out what the company spent until after they voted. A perfect example is is Amazon. You know, company spent millions of dollars combating the the campaigns in Alabama and on Staten Island. Well, Amazon, guess what? They were not required to to file until the very end of March. That was they were literally counting the ballots at JFK eight when. Amazon's disclosure came through. So it would have been nice for workers to say, hey, here's a form that says, um, you know, Amazon spent, um, you know, $4 million last year or or this past year, Amazon spent, uh, you know, $13 million or whatever. But you often don't have that information until it's in, until, frankly, it's no longer valuable. And so 
again, the disclosures are nice in that it, it gives us a general sense of where where these consultants are operating and who's using them. But you really can't trust the system and you cannot trust it at all, in my opinion, to really put a peg on how much money is flowing through this world. That is like that is unknowable under this current system. Well, and, you know, even just a sort of cursory look at what is filed, uh, you know, it's an astronomical amount of money, right? Uh, Any workplaces that are filing this, you know, paperwork late, uh, you're still seeing millions of dollars for any one campaign. You have to think if you're paying $3,200 a day for one consultant and maybe they bring on a team of two or three others that come into a workplace of 60 people, they hang out for multiple weeks. I mean, that's a lot of money that employers are willing to to throw into keeping workers from organizing collectively in the workplace. And when you try to wrap your head around it, it really does kind of boggle the mind just how much money can is, is flowing through. And in a lot of these cases, you know, workers are they're pushing for a dollar raise or whatever. So I think mm-hmm. for a lot of them, it's 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 galling to see that a sort of not even particularly large company just spent two hundred thousand dollars on on these consultants. And I talked to workers to that effect. You know, one place, uh, El Milagro, uh, food food maker in Illinois, uh, where they, according to disclosures, spent well over a million dollars on on consultants. And I you know I talked to workers there. Who said, you know, they they were fighting for, you know, basic raises and to see how much was spent was kind of mystifying to them. Right. And again, it comes back to the point that it's not about the money that they would spend on, you know, a dollar or two dollar raise over two years or what have you. Right. It's about ceding power to workers in the workplace and not having, you know, uh, shutting the door in them before you can even, you know, try and force them to offer you a seat at the table. Right. And, um, you know, this is a fantastic work that you've been doing. And I think it's a, it's much needed in trying to to shed light on this industry. It has quite a hold on the organizing and is, is you know, quite a big backstop against uh, broader organizing capacity. Right. Um, and, and hopefully continued conversations about what's happening with the union busting industry might lead to uh, strengthening of the laws that would actually bring consequences against these individuals who flout the law in the course of the anti-union campaign or, you know, uh, don't file the paperwork quick enough, right? Because right now, even the the fines assessed for not filing paperwork is a drop in the bucket for a multi-million dollar corporation, right? Fantastic work. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to me about this today. Could you please let folks know where to find you, find your work, what, you know, what you're working on, what's next for you? Sure. Yeah. My stuff is, is up on uh, HuffPost.com. I'm also on Twitter or X or whatever it's being called today. My handle is Jameson, J-A-M-I-E-S-O-N. And uh, yeah, more more labor stories to come. I, I appreciate your interest in, in the series, Mel. It was it was fun to to dig into this world for a while. It is uh, pretty maddening, you know. Um, it, it's kind of like following down the you know falling down the rabbit hole in many senses. So really great work. That's it for us here at the Real News Network podcast. Once again, I'm Mel Buer, staff reporter at the Real News Network. Follow us on your favorite social media and don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so we can continue bringing you independent, ad-free journalism. Until next time. Thank you so much for watching the Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work, so please... Tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.